during the day, Graham Jones' grain sheds in Tullamore in central New South Wales seem normal enough. A bounce back harvest following years of drought means he has almost 3,000 tonnes of wheat in storage. But at night time, the mice move in. They are everywhere, on the grain, around it, under it, and there's little he can do. Because we had such a good seasons, we were full to the brim everywhere, and we put hay in front of the sheds to hold the excess grain in, get that extra couple of loads in. When the mouse came, we thought they'd go, and they didn't, and they just bred and bred. And yeah, that's why it looks as bad as what it does. The mice arrived around February, and haven't shown any signs of leaving. Mice can give birth to a litter of up to 10 offspring every 20 days, and they can fall pregnant as soon as they've given birth. They can reach near plague proportions before farmers are even aware of a problem. Just over it, just yeah, like everyone else, just the smell, the stench, you just, you never get used to it. But it's not just his sheds where he's got a problem. The mice have delayed him sowing this year's canola crop because it could be eaten before it has a chance to grow. There are no silos in the area for economic reasons and grain bagged and stored outside his sheds is also not safe. So his priority is to remove all the possible food sources for the mice plague. He's selling his grain earlier than he planned, forcing him to enter the market at a lower value than he'd hoped for. We needed to get it off in a hurry, so we had to buy a bagging machine and we've got a lot more grain in the paddocks and that's giving a feed source for the mice, so we need to get rid of that feed source before we sow to try and get the population down. But we're up against it, but we'll get there. It's a race against time as the sowing season draws closer to its end and mice try to be everywhere where there is grain even inside machines. He's coping the best he can. Yeah, coming home and finding them, just got to look away. <laughs> Ignore, you can focus on the positives, I guess. Like I said, what you saw here was a perfect storm. Further north, on Adam McRae's farm near the town of Canamble, mice have eaten his future. Last year, when he was harvesting good crops of wheat and hay, they arrived. We got through to harvest. We baled, baled our hay and straw, stacked it up, and then by about February, they came marching in, and it was, geez, it was nearly overnight. They just arrived in, in big numbers, and we started, you know, we started baiting. We are baiting twice a week around the um, hay bales, the stacks of hay bales and stuff. And yeah, it wasn't too long before the damage really started to mount up. We were killing lots of mice, but you know, it seemed for everyone that died, 10 were coming in for the funeral and, um, and this kept going and going. And they've done a lot of damage. As soon as the mouse plague hit, Adam buried 500 bales of hay for safekeeping. The mice destroyed the rest, about 1,500 bales. Only a few are now worth salvaging. We're in the hundreds of thousands where we're, where we're looking at with our losses. It sort of gets you on a number of levels, I reckon. You know, it, there's obviously an economic cost, but it's probably not the one that really hits you the most. I think it's, you know, my son drove the truck, you know, to pick up the hay. We had a big team of guys do the straw, um, a lot of work, and just put the icing on the cake with harvest. Um, and the effort to, to get it all to where it was and stacked and tarped and, you know, it, was, it really was an achievement. It's not just the immediate financial impact that has farmers like Adam worried. Many across New South Wales have stored hay for when the next drought comes. Now they'll have a little, if anything, in reserve to get them through. When you build, I think, yeah, fodder reserves of, of that size of that volume, they really are the things that'll keep the, you know, not only farms and, and farm businesses ticking, but the rural economy ticking. They'll keep, you know, they'll keep a guy employed um, or, or a couple, you know, feeding stock when it does get tough and all that sort of thing. So yeah, you know, these, these reserves that have taken a tumble 
will really, really hurt later on. We're lucky enough to be having a good season now, but when that rain starts falling, that's when we're really going to feel the pinch um, of not having the fruits of our labour around us. We have try to prepare for drought and, and really think we've you know, done, a, done a pretty good job and pretty much happy for the next drought to run at us really um, with, the, with the job that a lot of people have done and, and there are just so many people that you know, if, if we weren't having you know, a reasonable year right now, we'd be worried straight away and that's not good. <laughs> CSIRO researcher Steve Henry has been on the front lines of this recent mouse plague since it began. He's visiting affected farmers like Adam to understand what happened, assess the extent of mouse damage, talk about what they can do now, and also how they can better prepare for next time. In one farm not far from here, we know of a haystack that contained 3,000 bales that was completely contaminated and so the farmers were only left with the option of, of burning that hay. That was a $120,000 loss on one farm. One of the things we're concerned about now is, is the, the rate of over level, overwinter survival. So if we get a high level of overwinter survival of mice, then if conditions are favourable next spring, then they'll start breeding early from a high population base and that leads to a very rapid rate of increase. Steve Henry says this ongoing mouse plague is a once in a decade event. It's erupted across large parts of Australia. The scale of damage across New South Wales and southern Queensland is hard to quantify, but it's also occurring in parts of southern New South Wales, northwest Victoria, and even the York Peninsula in South Australia. To help contain the widening outbreak, the Australian Pesticides and Veterinary Medicines Authority has approved an emergency permit to allow bait producers to double the strength of zinc phosphate bait. And if mouse populations aren't reduced over winter, the scientist warns mice could re-emerge in even greater numbers. There's, there's, the, there's the physical cost of it, and that's, you know, that's devastating enough by itself, but then there's the ongoing psychological impact that it has, and you guys dealing with this every day. Yeah. So this is something that we've only just started looking into, but it seems like in, you know, in this area of northern New South Wales, it's been quite common you know, for farmers who have managed to put away hay to have it seriously impacted by mice. And you know, if you're hearing stories about you know, single farms losing $120,000 worth of hay on this farm, goodness knows how much they've lost. Further south, near the town of Parks, farmer Rob McGregor says he thought he'd avoided the worst of the mice following a wet start to the sowing season. But eventually, mice numbers on the property started ramping up, and even on a frosty night, they're easy enough to spot around his silo bags of wheat grain, and there are signs many more are burrowed under the surface. They just didn't seem to breed up in the numbers, whether that was because of the wet period we had there for a while, but it seemed like we'd kind of dodged a bullet, but we've noticed in the last week or two, uh, they really are starting to ramp up again. And the problem with that is, it, it's at a time where we'd normally be beginning to sow our canola, and canola seed being so expensive, the risk of damage uh, to a, a newly sown canola crop is quite high. Uh, so we just had to look at our strategies and consider what we're going to do with the, the mouse numbers spiking at the worst possible time for us. The mice have delayed Rob from sowing canola, but after working on some land that was once teeming with mice, he's ready to put a wheat crop in before it's too late. Following those years of drought, we, we, did, we finally got a, a reasonable season last year, a good season. And so it's, it's more that it's just been uh, so constant. It was because it was a big season, there was a lot of work in harvest. And then because of the wet summer as well, we had a lot of spraying through the summer. And now as we turn into sowing, we just, it just seems to be no end to, to what's going on. We're going into country here at the moment that is a uh, country that we've worked. Uh, it had really high mouse pressure, but be since we've worked it, it seems to have really done the trick and the mouse pressure here is nowhere near what it was. Where there are grain crops, there are usually mice. It's not a problem when mouse populations are low, but CSIRO says high populations are becoming a persistent problem. 
Australia recorded its worst mouse plague in 1993, with the animals responsible for about $96 million in losses. For farmers like Rob, the risk of damage to a crop is worth taking. It's not a case of the damage they've done, although they are, they are doing damage. They're, they've been uh, in our, like in our silo bags and, and in our, around our hay and around our storages, and you do get the nuisance value of them, of them in the houses, but it's more uh, the concern about the damage they may do as we go into sowing. So it's, there's that element of unknown still as to, to just what's ahead of us. The scale, you know, <laughs> some guys will talk about it, some guys won't. Um, and, and I think if you, yeah, went in and really had a look around, I know plenty of guys that have lost, you know, in the order of thousands of bales. And, you know, that's, that's a lot to take out of the system for next drought. And for Graham Jones, confronting a mouse plague on his farm is still better than enduring drought. Oh, a lot more optimistic than what we were a year ago. Yeah, no, things were pretty down and out then. You know, at least we've got something to sell now and can't, you know, we've got hurdles to jump, but at least we've got hurdles to jump. <laughs>